1941. Nazi Germany dominates continental Europe. It is vital to destroy the military power of the Nazi dictatorship and the industrial strength that sustains it. We needed an aircraft that was going to be able to go basically behind enemy lines and destroy their supply lines. There is only one way to strike directly at the brutal regime. Bomber Command took over and started taking the fight to the enemy. And it was the hard way. One aircraft has come to represent the courage and determination of all who flew and fought in a deadly, relentless aerial battle. As an aircraft, it was ahead of its time. It was more of a person than, than an aircraft. It was a powerful machine. Its aggressive capability will play a major role in the defeat of Nazi Germany. Its specialized missions will become part of aviation history. This is the story of the outstanding heavy bomber of World War II, the Lancaster, told by the men who flew her. As they have done many times before in the long and deadly war against Nazi Germany, aircrew of Bomber Command gather for the briefings that will detail their targets for the night. We went into the briefing room, and uh, there was always a huge map of Europe at the end with tapes on it to where the target was. I decided I didn't want to be called up because that would mean the army and I wasn't really a suitable physical man to go into the army, so I volunteered to go into air crew. I applied to be a pilot, and I was told there's a waiting list of one year, why not be an air observer? In other words, to become a navigator. Most guys wanted to be pilots in those days. Most of my father's disgust, because he was went through World War I as a driver, and uh, he didn't want me to be a, um, to fly. I went to Rhodesia to train as a pilot, and then I got a, a dose of malaria, and uh, I was scrubbed off the course. So I went down to South Africa to train as a bomb aimer. At the time, uh, 1943, there were, the losses of guns were so high that they said, no, you can't become a wireless operator, you'll have to be a gunner. And so I became a gunner. After a number of training places in England. I was, I was taught to fly in the, the United States in the Army Air Corps there. We had to learn the RAF way after we, after we got back. For air crew, the price paid in the fight for freedom is a grimly personal statistic. My own squadron, numerically, was wiped out twice during the period I operated. Because none of us really expected to finish a tour, especially when uh, you were getting towards the end. You, you felt, now, am I going to finish it or not? It takes a particular kind of courage to climb aboard an aircraft. Fully aware of the growing losses amongst aircraft and crews, the slim chance of surviving. We met a crew, and they were all excited. They were going to do their first operation. And we said, oh, good luck to them. And that was the last anybody ever heard of them. They just disappeared. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The word last comes in many, many times in preparation because you've written your last letter, possibly. 
you had possibly your last meal and you've had your last cigarette. And yet, night after night, airmen, every one of them a volunteer, will make the long flight through hostile skies, determined to smash the Nazi war effort. This was something we had to achieve to wipe out uh, as much of the enemy's uh, industry and um, occupy as many people defending Germany as, as was possible. In the counterattack against Nazi aggression, the Avro Lancaster and the men who fly her will become the mainstay of Britain's bomber command. It will fly the greatest number of sorties and deliver a greater tonnage of bombs than any other aircraft. Bomber Command entered the war equipped with twin-engined aircraft that are no match for the enemy they would face. Hitler's armies, aided by the Luftwaffe, sweep across the Low Countries and into France. The men and machines of Bomber Command join the fight to disrupt the advance. It becomes a losing battle. The, uh, the Blenheims during the day were, were sitting ducks to, uh, to single-engine fighters. The Blenheims and the battles, of course, they were the main casualties in the, in the Battle of France, where they were shot down. Well, complete squadrons were, were shot down sometimes. Faced with the demands of modern warfare, these aircraft, with basic equipment and limited range, are completely inadequate for the task demanded of them. On the 17th of May, 1940, 12 Blenheims were sent to a place called Jean Bleu. How many aircraft of those 12 do you think we lost? A lot. All 12. Hard lessons are being learnt at great cost. We are sitting ducks, very battle squadrons, Handley Page Hamden squadrons, Whitley squadrons, and Blenheim squadrons in 1940 were almost decimated. At Dunkirk, British forces are evacuated from France. Britain and her Commonwealth stand alone. Only Bomber Command can carry the fight back to the Nazi homeland. Where we are back against the wall and going to take back and going to push Hitler off his couch. Lacking equipment and instruments capable of precision navigation and targeting, only one in three aircraft succeeds in getting within five miles of its target. 50% of bombs fall in open countryside. A map reading isn't all that easy, you know. Particularly if you're traveling at about 180 miles an hour. 21, That's three miles a minute, and if you have 20 seconds in thinking, scratching your backside, you know, you've gone a long way off track. <laughs> 169 aircraft set off to raid Berlin. Fewer than half reach the target. Very few bombs actually fall upon the Nazi capital. Nine are killed and 32 injured on the ground. 120 aircrew die on this operation. And Britain itself has come under savage aerial attack. They started bombing out open cities. Not only London, Coventry, Plymouth, Manchester, and various others. In the course of the war, over 43,000 civilians are killed and many more seriously injured in German bombing raids on Britain. The ruthless nature of the Nazi war machine generates a loathing of the Fuhrer and all he stands for. What do you think about us going over to Berlin and doing the same to them? I should think so too. A bit worse than this, I hope, with a wicked bugger like he is. Bomb on tenfold. I'm sorry for the women and children of Berlin, but what about the women and children of this country? Well, if I was a man, I'd go over there and I'd give them the same as what they gave us here. 
there became an urgent need for aircraft powerful enough to cross the inhospitable skies of occupied Europe and strike hard at the heart of the Third Reich. A new generation of warplane is developed, the four-engined heavy bomber. They are the Sterling, the Halifax, and the aircraft that will be described as the finest bomber of World War II, the Avro Lancaster. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Give us the tool, and we will finish the job. Lancaster will become part of Bomber Command's effort to destroy the Nazi industrial might. It will play the major role in this operation. But its origins lay in another, far less successful design. Three years before the outbreak of war, Roy Chadwick, Avro's chief designer, responds to an Air Ministry specification for a twin-engine medium bomber powered by two Rolls-Royce Vulture engines. The first prototype of this aircraft, the Avro Manchester, flies on the 25th of July, 1939. Problems are immediately obvious. The Vulture engines lack power, and there are handling problems while in flight. However, when war breaks out six weeks later, the Manchester bomber is rushed into service. But the Vulture engines are prone to bearing failures and overheating, causing fires. In spite of modifications, the Manchester continues to suffer numerous problems affecting its performance and reliability. The Manchester was completely underpowered and quite, uh, quite useless. At Avro, Chadwick and his team of designers are already planning to develop the Manchester into a potent four-engine bomber with the highly successful Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, replacing the unreliable Vulture. So Roy Chadwick added another four foot six and a half inches on each wing span and made it a four engine job. And that was absolutely ideal. Here the propeller is being introduced to the aeroplane, of which in the future it will be an integral part. Known as the Merlin Manchester or Manchester Mark III, for security reasons, it is named unofficially the Lancaster by its design team. The Manchester's wingspan of 90 feet is extended to accommodate the extra engines. This increase in the wing area also improves the new aircraft's takeoff performance. The flying prototypes of the new aircraft are an immediate success. As an aircraft, it was ahead of its time. Technologically, it was a fantastic aircraft, and also she had a sort of character of her own, you know. And the name that will become legend is now official. The Lancaster Mark I is ordered into full production. She was a beauty. There's no doubt about it. Roy Chadwick designed a really tip-top aircraft there. It wasn't designed for comfort. Basically, it's a, it's a metal tube with a, a main spar to support the wings and the engines, and then it has miles of cables, uh, electronic equipment. The Lancaster will acquire the Manchester's most singular feature, a spacious and unobstructed bomb bay. A typical bomb load would be either 15 1,000 pounders, or a cookie and cans, which was a 4,000 pounder, and uh, 12 cans of incendiaries. The Americans couldn't carry the bomb loads that the Lancaster could. As 1941 draws to a close, the Avro Lancaster enters operational service. And Bomber Command gains a new commander, the single-minded, uncompromising Air Chief Marshal Arthur Harris. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else. They sowed the wind, and now, they are going to reap the whirlwind. In the aerial battle to defeat Nazi Germany, 
the gloves are about to come off. The gathering strength of Bomber Command will be used to wreck the centers of German war production, shattering the confidence of munitions workers, forcing them to abandon their factories. The civil population of Germany have, however, an easy way to escape from these severities. Abandon their work and go out into the field and watch the home fires burning from a distance. The Lancaster makes its first operational sortie. It is an unremarkable debut for such a remarkable aircraft. As four Lancasters from 44 Squadron take part in a night operation, sowing anti-shipping mines off the German coast. The first operational bombing mission for the Avro Lancaster comes seven days later. Two Lancasters join a force of 124 other aircraft in a night raid on the German city of Essen. Four aircraft are lost during the raid. On the ground, very little damage is done to a city that is home to many major munitions factories. Increasing numbers of Lancasters are now joining the squadrons of Bomber Command. And pilots, converting from more familiar aircraft, are quick to appreciate the Lancaster's flying qualities. The Lank was such a different aircraft. It was much lighter, much more positive in its reactions to control, and it handled quite, quite beautifully. A force of 12 Lancasters embark on a daring daylight raid deep into Germany. Accurate navigation and precision bombing are essential. It is a round trip of 1,250 miles to the Bavarian city of Augsburg. Flying at low level, they are confronted by enemy fighters and a hail of anti-aircraft fire as they battle their way to the target. A factory producing diesel engines for the German U-boat fleet. In spite of losses, eight Lancasters make it through the barrage to deliver their bombs precisely on target. Of the 12 Lancasters taking part in the raid, only five badly damaged aircraft return. 49 aircrew are missing. Squadron leader John Nettleton, who five weeks earlier had led the first operational flight made by Lancasters, wins the Victoria Cross for his part in the operation and becomes a national celebrity, touring factories in Britain, addressing the workers. Well, I do thank you very much indeed. It is really most important that we do blast hell out of these Germans. And I, I show you that, that the more you give us, the more we'll do. Production of submarine engines at the Augsburg factory is halted. But the plant is back in operation within several weeks. Such losses, for so little result, were unacceptable. If Bomber Command is to remain in the war, it has no alternative but to fight by night. There was no other way we could do it. People thought, well, why didn't you bomb in daylight? Completely useless. We'd have all been shot down. Why didn't you do precision bombing? Completely useless. We hadn't got the equipment to do precision bombing in nighttime. If you had 15 bombs, and you're releasing them at half a second intervals, it would take seven and a half seconds from the first bomb to the last bomb. Bombs away. There goes the cookie. So how far would a lank fly in seven and a half seconds? Quite a distance between the first bomb and the last bomb. So that's why quite a number of bombs actually missed the target. The industrial raw district produces 80% of Germany's coal supplies and 75% of her steel. This network of war industries is clustered in and around Germany's major cities. 
German defenses are concentrated around these centers, creating a barrier of shells, high explosives, and night fighters guided by probing searchlights and the electronic gaze of radar. Searchlights could be a problem, and they had what was known as a master searchlight, which was a blue searchlight, which suddenly latched onto you and its radar control, and you couldn't dodge it. The airmen of Bomber Command will confront the increasing strength of these defenses. As Air Marshal Harris intensifies the aerial bombardment of the Third Reich. Cologne, Lubeck, Rostock, those are only just the beginning. But for the Nazis, the writing is on the wall. 73 Lancasters take part in the largest raid of the war to date. A total of 1,047 aircraft strike at the city of Cologne. That's not on your mind. Your mind is on the job you're there to do. 41 aircraft are lost. In Cologne, production is halted at 36 major factories. 70 others have their output reduced by half. Within a month, production is back to normal in the damaged city. Arthur Harris intends Bomber Command to become a war-winning weapon of devastating power. He resolves to strike harder and repeatedly at the enemy's resources. In your hands lie the means of destroying a major part of the resources by which the enemy's war effort is maintained. Let him have it right on the chin. Hitler's dream of total victory has not been realized. He demands a huge expansion in output from the German war industry. Bomber Command is about to be tested in the shadows of night and the fires of war. The head of Britain's bomber force is a staunch advocate of his command's ability to shorten the war. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Bomber Command aircrew are aware of the crucial role they play in crippling the German war effort and the high cost involved. On the one side, you wanted to go and get this extra flight behind you toward your 30. And on the other hand, you uh, didn't want to go because you were bloody scared and you knew the circumstances and the possibilities. The moment you enter the briefing room and you look at the, the, the board, and which is going to be unveiled and reveals its ribbon, and you straight away go to the point where the ribbon starts to come down. And so you know that that point is where the target is. Every crew member had a job to do of its own, and every crew member relied on the other, whether it was a pilot or a gunner. Um, they knew that if you didn't do your job right, their lives would be a risk. Everybody is important to each other or to everybody else. It is teamwork that counts. You live or die by the support of the rest of your mates. The Avro Lancaster carries a crew of seven, young airmen whose average age was 22. The old man of the crew was the mid a gunner, and he was 29, which he always thought was rather old. And the rest of us are in our early 20s. And, uh, of course, some were younger than that in other crews. The bomb aimer's position is in the plexiglass blister at the nose of the aircraft. Behind and below the pilot and flight engineer are the radio operator and navigator. I was behind my screen doing calculations, and I was so occupied that I really was in a position to almost shut out what was going on outside. And if you're running late, you just try and speed up a bit. 
So the navigator worked out all those sorts of problems. My flight engineer hated having to increase the revs to speed up. It mucked up his fuel consumption, and he prided himself on getting 1.1 miles to the gallon out of a lang. <laughs> the wireless operator's position is close to the Lancaster's cabin heater. And while the temperature at 20,000 feet in the night skies could drop to minus 40 degrees, his position by the heater is a dubious advantage. But the turbine is only about two inches from me. And of course, it was burning me like buggery. So down there was the open gangway. And of course, nothing to obstruct anything except cold air coming in from various holes all over the place. So you've got cold air, freezing air, blowing down there. You've got burning hot air down there. So the wireless operator is sitting something like this because he's been burnt like hell there and it's frozen there. Far back in the fuselage, separated from the rest of the crew, are the mid-upper and the rear gunner positions. Of the two, the rear gunner is the most isolated. He crouches behind four Browning machine guns, exposed to the elements, as well as the gunfire of stalking night fighters. You're at the very, very end of the aircraft. You're suspended, if you like, in midair. It is hard to imagine the reality of the rear gunner's situation in a space so cramped he is unable to wear his parachute. Faced with the prospect of being trapped in a disabled turret, unable to escape as his crippled aircraft plunges from the sky, it is the most vulnerable of locations. That's what the enemy aircraft would try and get rid of first. So it was, uh, the word we used in those days was pretty dicey, <laughs> pretty dicey. Once the targets of the night have been decided by Bomber Command Headquarters, they are passed to the squadrons. The airfields become a hive of activity as they prepare for another operation in the unremitting, relentless battle. The aircraft are fueled and bombed up. Final meals eaten. Parachutes are issued. And the, the WAF girl who would issue the parachute always had to stand the joke, bring it back if it doesn't work, you know. You always had the feeling that the ground crew, it was their aircraft, and they were only lending it to us to, to go and do a job. We couldn't take off without them. We couldn't fly without them. They, they were the boys who were 100% necessary. Not enough praise was given to a, a ground crew. They were, they were absolutely A1. With aircraft waiting, fueled and armed, there's a moment before the crews climb aboard. For some, this is the moment of greatest anxiety. You had had your briefing, you know what you were going to do, and we assembled outside our aircraft waiting for the time to go. And then the nerves were tight, and we didn't want to talk, and we all hated it, and it was a very unhappy time, till we got onto the aircraft. With the sun sinking over their bases, the crews board the aircraft. Engines burst into life waiting for the green light to take off and you whip the inner engines to the gate and the aircraft is still on the chocks and on the brakes and it's streaming pulling pulling again as you're uh, opening the throttles you, the, the flight engineer has got his hand behind them helping you to push them fully open and you really got to get the throttles fully open and it's a very heavy aircraft to lift off the ground. There's a green skip. There's an awful lot of power with the four engines, but there wasn't much problem controlling all that. And the roar of the, of the moment is something you, I just can't explain over here. It's absolutely fantastic, the power, and racing along the runway, fighting against the force of gravity, and straining, 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 and you're wondering whether you'll ever get off at the end of the runway. And then, before the end of the runway, and, boom, and you'd be up like a, a lift going up. Oh, I'm watching everything. OK. Good luck to them all, to the team that has done its job, to the team that is again on the job. Hundreds of aircraft rendezvous assembly points high above the coastline of East Anglia. 
where pilots set a course for their targets as the shadows close in around them. They fly towards a formidable air defense system. Almost a million men serve in Germany's air defense network. Another million and a half are engaged in air raid precautions and damage repair. There are over 150,000 anti-aircraft guns defending Germany's cities and industries. To overcome the fury of the enemy defenses, new tactics have been introduced. Formations of bombers no longer make their separate ways to the target. All aircraft now fly on the same heading, with only height and split-second timing separating them. The bomber's plane is probably a mile wide, half a mile deep. You have probably uh, seven or eight hundred bombers all heading for the same place. Too many, I reckon. The idea was for us all to keep to keep together as far as possible in, in the stream. And we used to start hitting other people's slipstreams. We started lurching about. It is hoped the enemy defenses will be overwhelmed by this concentrated mass of aircraft. It is a dangerous tactic. And it was a, an air traffic control officer's nightmare of the whole thing. Both the, the bomb aimer and the wireless operator yelled at me that uh, there was an aircraft approaching us on the port side. And I just caught a glimpse of it. It was another Lancaster. I heaved back on my control column and climbed, and he must have pushed forward on his and dived. We were so close that I could see his instrument panel like glow as he went underneath us and the rear gunner said he shook hands with the other rear gunner as they went past. The Nazi warlords, stunned by the weight of the attacks on their cities, reorganized their defenses. Night fighters are no longer directed onto individual targets by ground controllers. Instead, they wait over the target cities for the bomber stream to come to them. They dive down into their own anti-aircraft fire to pick off bombers, now silhouetted against the fires below. Lancasters on their bombing run fly straight and level and make easy targets. We suddenly saw another Lancaster burst into flames. And I can remember to this day, uh, Leo, a, a skipper, shouting at us, concentrate, it could be us next. In this savage battle, losses are mounting. 11,300 air crew have been killed during the first three years of the war. More than 12,000 will die in the fourth year alone. The cloak of darkness that should shield the bombers is no longer working. The battle in the shadows is about to reach a new and savage ferocity. The commanders of the Allied bombing squadrons have been tasked with the destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial and economic system. Aircraft are now equipped with a variety of electronic devices developed to baffle and confuse the enemy defenses. One of them is surprisingly simple. Window is the code name given to thousands of strips of aluminium foil cut to an exact length. Hurled from the aircraft and fluttering slowly to the ground, this metallic cloud reflects radar and swamps the air defense screens. Their screens just went blank covered with mush. To begin with, it was amazingly effective. But the more it was used, the less effective it became. As each new development is countered by the enemy, the pilots and crews still have to fly into the same cauldron of fire and flame. You could see the target sometime before you arrived. <laughs> and uh, you think, well, just hope you get through. They used to say that they chucked up everything except the kitchen sink. Searchlights pierce the night sky, seeking targets for the guns to finish off. Now, I immediately got coned by searchlights. Now, the 
Koenig is an experience not to be forgotten. Well, there's a few satellites ahead, but I had to th yeah. throw the aircraft around in all sorts of different ways to try and get out of it. And all the time they were shooting at me. So we opened up full speed, put the nose down, and we got nearly up to 400 miles an hour, which was far in excess of what the Lancaster should normally do. All too often, the desperate attempts to evade the deadly beam failed. As the Lancasters reach the target, evasion becomes impossible. The aircraft has to fly straight and level. All you concentrate on, I must get it plumbing those marshalling yards. I must get it smack on that factory. This is what you aim for. OK, steady. Right a little bit. The whole crew was saying, for God's sake, drop it more, let's get out of here. Two, three. And then you hear the two magic words. On the way. But even then, there could be no relaxing of desperate vigilance. That's just me by my nose. That, that's when the fear kicks in, because you're not expecting it. If you didn't see him, it was curtains, because with his firepower, you were just blown away. Keep your eyes open, mid -upper. You can imagine them, a direct hit on a bombed-up Lancaster. When the fighters are spotted, the sturdy Lancaster is capable of surprising maneuverability. A German night fighter came head-on to us. The flight engineer one saw it, the skipper saw it almost at the same time. And you shall call report. You, you descend at a high speed, and then you heave back and swing the aircraft right over the other way and climb as hard as you can go, and uh, everything's going flat out. You lose complete orientation. The G-force that is so tremendous that you're pinned to your turret. Many damaged aircraft will never make it back to their bases. Pilots will nurse their injured machines over the miles to fail moments from home. All around us, so horrible things were happening. Two of our aircraft, at about 700 feet, collided over the end of the over the end of the airfield, just off the airfield, and wiped out most of the crew. And another aircraft flew into the ground. Nineteen Lancasters of 617 Squadron carry out Operation Chastise the attack on the dams of the Ruhr Valley. Specially modified Lancasters carry the bouncing bombs developed by Barnes Wallace. Huge 9,250 pound mines packed with high explosive designed to rotate, skip across the surface of the water in front of the dams and settle hard against their walls before exploding. Using VHF radio, Guy Gibson, the leader of the raid, maintains direct contact with all his aircraft, guiding them to the target, correcting their bomb runs. It is the first use of the master bomber technique. It is a technique that will be adopted by a new target finding and fixing force. Fitted with the latest navigational equipment, and trained intensively in precision bombing, the Pathfinder force will be the first over the target, marking the precise aiming points. When they got to the target, they put down their markers, which we could see, and we would bomb their markers. D-Day. The Allied armies land on the Normandy beaches. The main bombing effort is now focused on devastating the defences facing the advancing Allied armies. Lancasters are the only aircraft capable of carrying the huge 21-foot-long, 12,000-pound Tallboy bomb and the even more massive Grand Slam 22,000-pound bomb, both created by Barnes Wallace. Reinforced blockhouses, submarine pens, viaducts, railway tunnels, launch sites of the V-1 and V-2 rockets, even the German battleship Tirpitz sheltering in a Norwegian fjord. All are targets for Lancasters modified to carry the huge earthquake bombs. 
They bomb with precision, hitting their targets hard and accurately. Operation Thunderclap. 796 Lancasters form the main strike force targeting the German city of Dresden. Classified as a major rail and communication center. To the air crew of Bomber Command, it is another long and dangerous mission. It was just a case of there was a job to be done and you do it to the best of your ability. Uh, and you hope that that every little bit that you do is shortens the war that little extra bit, that little bit. War is war. Inevitably, people are going to get killed, the same as they got killed in London, Coventry, and everywhere else. Well, there's a target straight ahead, Skip. It is a raid that will cause a controversy that endures today. The intensity of the bombing and conditions on the ground combine to create a firestorm. It was just Dante's Inferno for the people on the ground. The bombing of Dresden will focus attention on the civilian casualties caused by Allied bombing. There will be claims and counterclaims as to the importance of Dresden as a military target. Sir Arthur Harris will be held responsible for ordering the raid. It will taint his reputation for years to come. But the reasons for this particular raid are varied and controversial. I personally went to see Butch Harris after the war and I spoke to him, and he told me, he said that uh, he, he personally did not want to bomb Dresden. <laughs> he said it was too far for too little. The war continues as Hitler clings to power. With callous disregard for the suffering of his people, he declares, if the war is lost, the nation will also perish. Their fate is inevitable. There is no necessity to take into consideration the basis on which the people will need to continue. With 55 squadrons now equipped with the Lancaster, it has become the principal aircraft of Bomber Command. They continue to pound targets in Germany as the Allies fight their way into the heart of the Third Reich. In sudden contrast to their usual role, Lancasters are given a humanitarian mission, Operation Manor. A couple of months before the war finished, and there we were faced with something totally different from our normal job. The Dutch, particularly in the western part of Holland, were starving. A week before, we'd been bombing Bremen at 18,000 feet. And here we were now on a mercy flight pushing all these different types of food, powdered eggs, chocolates, all sorts of things, push them up to Bombay. 31 Lancaster squadrons take part in Operation Manor, flying over 3,000 sorties in nine days. There was a big white cross in, in the field. That was our drop-in zone. But as you flew across the town, thousands and thousands of people in the streets and the fields, hanging out the windows, on top of the roofs, and they were all waving at you. I shall never forget the sight in my life. They had got up to every roof, every top, and they had got uh, pillar slips and white blankets and so on, and they had spelt out on the rooftop, God bless you. There were tears in their eyes, I can tell you that. And the last trip we did, we just got across the, the sea uh, at noon time, and we heard on the RT, Mr. Churchill, announcing the official end of the war. Sign the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe. Long live the cause of freedom. The European war is over. Lancasters assist in the homecoming of Allied prisoners of war. It was Operation Exodus, which was a repatriation job. These British prisoners of war, some of whom have been in enemy hands for five years, are on their way home by air. Seeing those guys' faces, I'm thinking they were going to be home for their first Christmas. 
of a total of 7,377 Lancasters built. Some 3,500 are lost on operations. We give our services for the peace of this country. It is an aircraft that will be forever associated with the men of Bomber Command. But every time an aircraft didn't come back, that was seven people. We played a part in bringing the war to a swifter end. Of the 125,000 aircrew who served in Bomber Command during the war, 73,000 became casualties. 55,573 of them killed performing their duty. It was the highest loss rate of any of the British armed forces in the Second World War. The Lancaster fought a war for oh, 1942 right through to 1945 uh, as the main aggressive side of our, our war effort. Their controversial commander would pay tribute to the men who flew and fought in the battle. There is no parallel in warfare to such courage and determination in the face of danger over so prolonged a period. Such devotion must never be forgotten. <laughs>